next up, we have Diego Farias joining all the way from Stockholm, Sweden. He's the CEO and co-founder of Amuse. Hi, Diego. How's it going? Very good. How are you? All good. All good. Greetings from sunny Barcelona. I, w so I wish I could say the same, but it's uh, sun has already set in Stockholm and it's very uh, cold. <laughs> you're welcome here anytime. So thank you so much. Please. I heard mentions of tapas, so now I'm uh, now I'm definitely coming. <laughs> please. So Diego, can you start off by introducing yourself and telling us more about you and your background? Of course. So um, I'm based in Sweden, but obviously Diego, not a very Swedish sounding name, perhaps. And my father is from Chile in Latin America. I was born and raised in Sweden, so very, very, very Swedish. Um, I've been, uh, I guess, started my career cleaning trains back in 2000 or 2001. Went on to the post office, uh, into the hotel business and uh, joined the technology industry in 2004 when I joined a Swedish e-commerce startup um, that we sold to eBay in 2006 and um, kind of got my education there because I only I didn't finish or I didn't do university. So I, I went straight from high school into work life. So I learned the ropes of online marketing and how to work on the internet by doing it in an e-commerce uh, service that was very successful. Uh, after that, I went on to another Swedish startup uh, in the online gaming world called Stardog. Uh, which has turned out to be an insane incubator of talent, actually. Uh, everyone from like Daniel Ek, the founder of um, Spotify, to the founder of a sweet, big Swedish health tech company, all graduated through this company, Stardoll, and so did I. And then I joined the um, music industry in 2010 with a solid technological foundation in my backpack and a toolkit that um, Warner Music thought could be useful for what they perceived to be um, a digital era that was about to start. So I was brought in uh, to do that at Warner Music. I was there for a couple of years. I moved on to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, worked with Hans Holger Albrecht, who is now the CEO of uh, Deezer uh, for a few years in Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, that's where I founded uh, Amuse. Um, I founded Amuse in uh, 2015. Wow. So, and since, since you started in an e-commerce company, how did you transition how or why did you transition to the music industry and what were the reasons for that? Well, the reasons were that music is way cooler than anything else I've ever worked with. If you don't agree, then probably the wrong conversation to be had. Um, 110%. <laughs> uh, Nothing is cooler than working with music. Uh, no, I mean, the transition wasn't very obvious. I don't come from a music background. I'm not, I'm not a musician myself, had no formal training in music. Uh, but I was asked by Warner Music to come and join a company that were trying to grapple with the idea of becoming a digital uh, music company. And uh, I think for them, they needed someone who was very digitally savvy and who was curious about this change and didn't come with a lot of previous kind of baggage from the music industry. And, and perhaps that fit myself. Uh, so that's uh, kind of how I transitioned into it. So Diego, why, why Amuse? Uh, how did you come up with this idea? Uh, we were mentioning the artist's pain points in previous talks. So yep. what was the need you saw that led to Amuse being created? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think, you know, sometimes when you hear entrepreneurs speak, um, it always sounds like at some point someone has like a eureka moment where they're like, oh, I'm trying to vacuum under the bed, but it hurts my back. So now I will come up with an extension and become a millionaire. That's kind of always the uh, startup story for to some extent. But for me, it was more of a growing need that had been growing on me for some time. So when I was at Warner Music, I was discouraged by the lack of innovation in that business. Um, and uh, no disrespect to Warner, they're doing incredibly well nowadays, but back in 2010, 2011, it wasn't a company that was trying to change the, the world of music. It was a company that was trying to maintain the status quo. And I came in there with all of my crazy internet ideas. And I was like, oh, we should be looking at data as indicators of traction, or we should yeah. use data to build the models on how we can market music, or you know, all of these crazy internet types of ideas. Uh, so that was kind of the first part. The second part was being exposed to Africa, which to me, 
being a, a, a white slash Latino guy from Sweden, entering Africa, it felt like maybe they had problems that were unique to Africa. That was my initial thought. But the more time I kind of pondered the, the challenges that they had, the more the African problem became a global problem. And those problems were that they're the same for a young kid in a suburb of Barcelona or um, a young kid in a suburb of Stockholm. They were, a lot of these kids lived their lives on mobile, but the world of music was not built for mobile. Um, a lot of them lack credit cards. Um, they might have other types of funds, but they might not have credit cards. So what I was looking at initially was how to solve kind of the distribution issue, which seemed for me to be the gateway into the world of music. So there were two main problems and, and they were both access related. One was people couldn't use phones. And the second one was um, they didn't have, or, or they, they couldn't use their phones to interact with this. And if they didn't have a credit card, they were pretty much shut out. So what I figured was that those sounded like technological challenges. And given my fairly strong technological background, if you don't mind me saying so, I figured maybe I can solve this from a technological standpoint. So less of a eureka moment and more of a realization that there were a bunch of players in the space that seemingly lacked the incentive to change. And there were tons of artists knocking on the door to try to enter the music space who for different reasons weren't being let in. So it felt like a perfect solution for, or a perfect opportunity for me to enter that white spot and attack it. So for me, the initial uh, idea was solve distribution, get thousands and thousands of users onto our platform, and then let's build additional services for them as we go. So that's kind of the initial thinking. Now, um, so how, how's, how's the muse different from other music distributors? Uh, can you mention uh, a couple of tools and, and dive? Yeah, dive yeah of course. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, I have a, one of my two cats is right here eating. Oh. So if, you, if there's any weird noise, then uh, forgive, uh, forgive me. Um, so, uh, but it's mandatory nowadays to bring your cat to a Zoom call. So I'm guessing you guys have rules around that. Um, so the, 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 the first thing I would say is that Amuse, was, Amuse is a distributor only because we had to build a distribution service. I, I have no ideas about building a really cool distribution company. That was not where I came from. I wanted to solve bigger kind of changes in the industry than distribution. Distribution to me was a basic service that we needed to solve. Uh, it's a service that hasn't been changed in a long period of time. The business model looks pretty much the same. The players are pretty much the same. Many of the players have been around for 10, 15, 20 years. The incentive for them to improve their offerings, uh, you know, not very high. So for me, I was like, all right, let's do distribution. Let's do it way better than everyone else. But our plan was always to build services around this, more innovative services for modern artists, modern independent artists. So what we started to do was the first thing we did was um, we built this really cool data system. We named it after all of these cool uh, SoundCloud rappers, for example. So the name of the data center is called Lil Data, like Lil Wayne, but Lil Data. So Lil Data is basically looking at trends changes in trends across all of the songs on our platform. And it's giving us indications of songs that we should interact with. So the first song, the first idea we had was to build a label on top of the distribution platform. So songs would naturally graduate into a record label and the decisions of the record label would be what I had been dreaming of when I was at Warner Music, data-based. So the data, the record label was our first business. The second business, once again, leveraging this data advantage that we had, was to build what we call fast forward. Fast forward is an automated royalty system that calculates royalties, advanced royalties, and instead of kind of locking down rights and forcing people into long-term deals, which I am completely against, we just advance money automatically to thousands and thousands of users around the world all the time, really cool. And the third thing we built is our premium services where we've built a bunch of cool stuff like splitting royalties, like building up structures for teams and labels. So we've just continued to innovate, innovate, innovate on top of this kind of funnel that we've created. Can, can you tell us a, a, a couple of um, success stories that, that you've had uh, in the last uh, couple of years? Yeah, I mean, I, I, 
when I participate in events like this, uh, you know, one of the things that people come back to is, you know, we had Lil Nas X on our platform. I think Lil Nas X was a great example of the offering that we have. It's a really bad example for me <laughs> if you're thinking about the fact that the intention was to sign him, <laughs> because yeah. I sure I sure didn't succeed in that. So I'd be happy to share my biggest uh, failure with you. But I think um, the Lil Nas X uh, project, uh, to a large extent, exemplifies all of the things that I have said up until this point. There is a need for an entry level service, even for kids in Atlanta, which is where Lil Nas X was. He uploaded his first couple of songs to Muse. They did very, very poorly. We saw that Old Time Road started to bubble the days after Christmas. He uploaded it by chance. He had nothing to lose on a model like a Muse. He uploaded Old Time Road. We saw that it started to bubble really early. We had presented a deal for him already before the end of the year. 29th or 30th of December. The song started to take off in February, March, a couple of months later, but we were already on the ball two, day, two, two three days after it was released. So we offered him a deal. He didn't sign it because he was unsure about the sample that he had, which turned out to be a nine inch nail sampling, um, which Sony did incredibly well to clear. Um, and, you know, he ended up signing with. Um, uh, Sony, we, I offered him a million dollars to really good terms, uh, but uh, he signed with Sony Music. They've done a fantastic job with Lil Nas X. He took a, a big bet on them. Uh, they delivered and uh, kudos to Sony Music. And my job after that has been to find the next uh, Lil Nas X, which I'm still in the process of uh, finding. <laughs> oh, wow. So really, it's incredible when you say that you identify the song like in, in, in two days and all, all the patterns. Is it, is, is that like the, can, can other songs can be recognized also in two days or what would be like your average time uh, for a song, for a good song to be discovered? Well, I mean, I think you need to just pause. Like two days was great for us because it started to have initial traction early. Not all songs work like that. The, the industry is so focused on the release week that goes for managers, that goes for the artists, that goes for everyone. I just signed a track um, right before Christmas that was uploaded to Amuse in 2018. It took that song a long time to find its audience. The key is, when do you sign the track? What type of momentum does it have? What type of a composition of uh, cool signals is it exhibiting? So to us, it's not uh, so much, you know, how long does it take from upload? It's more, what does the collective picture looks li look like at the time of the signing? And, and it can be two days of data, it can be five days of data, it can be three weeks of data. It depends a little bit on the track. So you, you mentioned uh, about your service, um, Fast Forward. Yeah. Can you walk us through how does um, Amuse Pro works? Yeah, so sorry, uh, Amuse Pro and Fast Forward are two different services, but I'll talk about Fast Forward, which is that really okay. cool thing. Um, Pro is really cool too, by the way. Uh, sorry if I was uh, shooting down my own services here, but um, Fast Forward is what, it's, it's, such a, it's such a strong proposition. I'll tell you by starting with a story. We have a, a band called Blue Americans. Uh, they, they're based in the UK. They were gonna go to London uh, to do a showcase. Uh, from, I can't remember exactly where they live. If Blue Americans are listening, my sincere apologies. They didn't have the money really to be able to do a showcase which would put them in front of fans, which would, you know, would be good for their career, et cetera, et cetera. And then in their phone, they, they get an offer about getting future royalties paid out today. They took that offer, they play, paid plane tickets, they rented instruments, they did all that stuff, and they did their showcase in, 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 in London. That use case in itself is, is incredibly important to explain why we're doing this. The technical solution I will then address. But the key here is that advances has been exclusive for people who then sign away their rights. The only way to get an advance has been to also sign a dotted line to now this music is no longer mine. I am fundamentally against that. I don't think that that's how business should work. I think that music is a very valuable asset. And I think that asset should be able to be used by people in a more fair way. So the way that it then works is, you know, we have 
millions of tracks on our platform. We have a ton of data associated with these tracks. And we have little data, which by now is insanely intelligent. So what we do is basically we calculate a, a pessimistic six month future for the track. And it's based on all sorts of stuff, historical information, it's based on predictive modelings, it's based on you know, how much of the music is coming from playlists or how do we value the quality of those playlists? How often do they change the songs? It's based on so many different data points to be able to calculate a safe um, investment for us uh, in the future. But it also has to be um, courageous enough for someone to be able to want to take it. Otherwise, it doesn't make any damn sense. So, so that's kind of how the structure works. So we, we usually pay out between five and seven months of future earnings, um, which I think is really cool. So for the duration of those five to seven months, when the money's being um, recouped, um, we hold on to the music. And then as soon as the deal is done or the money is recouped, then the artist gets their master back. And uh, all they had to do was wait a couple of months and they got a big check in advance. Wow, that's uh, incredible. So since, since the artist keeps, yeah, more or less, because you mentioned this, this example now, but since the artist keeps 100% of their masters with a muse, how does a muse make money? What's the, what's the revenue model? Yeah, that's, so good question, of course. From the sound of it, it sounds like I'm running some type of a charity organization, which I wish I could. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, bills have to be paid. So the way we make our money, of course, is uh, we have a pro model, which is two tiers called Boost and Pro, which we charge for annual fee to use those types of services. There is a fee associated with accepting a fast forward uh, deal. And for the label signings that we do, we do a revenue split with the artist, perhaps more traditional to a record label, but we never buy rights. We only license or, or do distribution deals for the rights. So those would be our revenue sources, um, but we still have a free distribution service. And I think that's super important. Um, so, so that's perhaps a little bit confusing at first, but um, I think, I hope that my, my explanation was satisfactory. Yeah, perfect, per perfect. So going, going a little bit back on, on, on the music and, and what's happening worldwide, have you seen any specific genre going exponentially in the last couple of years or not really? Yeah, I mean, listen, I would say that the music industry or the independent music industry, it looks pretty much like it looked before. A lot of these uh, people were sitting at home with their computers or with their instruments making music. Uh, they might have, you know, they might go to a recording studio from time to time, but a lot of the, the stuff that's fueling this growth in the independent music space has probably been fairly unchanged through Corona. The changes that have been very dramatic has probably been that a lot of those Younger people in many cases have probably lost their jobs as a result of Corona or, or something like that. On the flip side of that coin, a lot of people suddenly have a lot more time to spend to hone in on their crafts. So what we've seen is a lot of kind of, a lot of music that perhaps isn't so based on you being able to interact with a band in a recording studio, a lot of that type of music has expanded. What type of music could that be? It could be lo-fi, funk or whatever all those styles are called. It could be hip hop where a lot of people can access rights or, or sorry, beats from places like BeatStars or Splice or Tracklib or whatever. And all they need is a good mic and a calm environment around them. So definitely music of that style without defining it as a individual genre, I think has, has had uh, the best kind of boost uh, in terms of um, uh, music styles during during the corona uh, time so and after after hitting one million users what are amuses uh, next steps and, and challenges do you have any product service uh, in the funnel to be launched maybe this year yeah i mean um we're continuing to develop our stuff all the time and because we do it at such a fast pace more stuff will happen in 2021 um because it's only march so, uh, but, I, but I don't have anything specific that I can share today. Um, but for me, 1 million, I mean, that number is fantastic and we're incredibly happy about that. But uh, I, we know that there are a lot, of more, a lot of artists out there. We know that 
new artists are being created all the time. You know, our ambition is not numbers driven. It's to um, engage with as many art individual, uh, sorry, independent artists around this world as possible. I think that the offering we have seems to be resonating incredibly well given our growth. So I think it's fair to assume that we can grow uh, that base a lot, both in 2021, but also in 2022. So the goals that I have for our business is to continue to deliver the best service we have and continue to um, please our users so that they have continued trust in us going forward. Thank you. So before we go to the audience questions, one, one last question uh, to wrap it up. So how will the music industry change after this pandemic? What can we expect? Do, do we see uh, independent artists uh, exponentially growing? Uh, what else can you, can you say about the future of music industry? I think if, if you didn't reach, uh, sorry, read uh, Mark Mulligan's uh, posts from uh, maybe last week, yeah. I think Keith uh, Joplin was uh, supposed to join uh, this, this forum, but if you haven't read the media's yeah. research about how the kind of gap between um, independent music and major music, how it's shrinking, please mm -hmm. go ahead and read that. Yeah. It's very safe to assume that the independent music space uh, just given its format and how wide it has become and how many people are included in that group, that it will dramatically outperform the growth of what the majors are doing. Uh, I think that's very fair to assume. So I think within the next few years, maybe as late as 2030, the independent music space will generate more revenues than what the major uh, side does. So for me, that's incredibly encouraging and obviously something that I feel very, very optimistic about. I think for us and for anyone else in the space, it's going to come down to who can create the best offer for artists. And that's my entire raison d'etre. That's why we wake up. That's why we go to work every day. That's why we work really, really hard. Uh, so let's just see how it goes. Thank you, Deo. Now I'll pass the mic on to Juan Chaima, who will be asking uh, the audience questions. Thank you, Deo. Thank you. Hello. Hello, Diego. Thank you so much for being with us. So we have many questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. We have a first question from Jose Mondras that says, why Amuse changed their approach to Latin America previous to the pandemic? And what is next in Latham for Amuse? So um, I appreciate the question, but um, Jose, we haven't changed our strategy. Um, what we've been doing is uh, we continue to work really, really hard in Latin America. Um, and uh, we have been growing across all of Latin America. Um, in markets like Chile and Argentina and Peru, we're seeing incredible growth. In markets like Brazil, we've continued on an already strong presence that we had and growing from that uh, place. But what we did was um, we've been kind of doing pop-ups in different markets to really immerse ourselves. And we did so in the US, we've done so in Latin America, we've done so across Europe. Um, and then, and then we continue to kind of explore and establish ourselves in additional markets. So we haven't actually done any changes to uh, uh, our Latin American strategy. And I think if, if, if people don't understand how important the Latin American music space is in not only in shaping culture, but also in terms of how fast it's growing and how important it is for the international music space, then they've been living in a hole underground for a long time. So huge fan of the Latin American space and uh, very much looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Diego, for addressing this question. We have another question from Frédéric Dassani saying, is the process of song recognition done in person or using AI? Uh, it's the process of song. Um, so, we, so we don't use AI anywhere on our site. I mean, every time I meet uh, venture capital firms, they're like, um, what about AI? And I'm like, no, I mean, we use a lot of machine learning algorithms and uh, have, those are basically really advanced um, mathematical methods that improve over time. So the majority of our work is done automatically, yes, um, but there are some kind of human elements involved in, in many of those processes. With that said, fast forward, for example, is a fully automated process that also relies on machine learning um, mathematical algorithms. Uh, but uh, sorry to disappoint you, my friend, no flashy, fancy AI on Amuse yet. 
Well, we had another question in regards to that where an, an anonymous participant said how Amuse collects its data. So, so we, we don't, that so that's also a good question, of course. So we, we collect data on behalf of talent, on behalf of the artists that we represent. Uh, we collect the data so that we can show it to our users. So as an artist, you have the right to see, uh, um, sorry, um, consumption data around your music. We collect it on the behalf of the artists from the different music services and reproduce it on, uh, in their apps and on our website. And in the meantime, we can also use the same information and build a cool, uh, cool models on top of it and, uh, and look at a broader picture, which is obviously the benefit of it. Great, thank you so much, Diego. And we have a last question by Dylan Brown saying, how do you find new artists to engage with and how do you use technology again to discover smaller unrepresented artists? That's a good question, Dylan. And uh, I mean, the last part of that question is exactly what Amuse does. Um, we only use it for that. Um, you know, you don't have to be smart to see that uh, Shakira is doing really well. I mean, you just need to be able to read to do that. But uh, what we want to do is, is work with um, earlier stage talent. And for that, we, we need to be very, very clever. So we have a lot of industry experience. Uh, a lot of people have worked with any kind of major label ranks and whatnot. And we use that in, combina in combination with this really cool data center that I mentioned, the little data uh, center to really be able to identify signals very early on. I'm sorry to say that the exact composition of um, signals, that's our Coca-Cola recipe. So I hope you uh, don't get upset with me, Dylan, for not sharing it to uh, everyone who's on the call right now. Well, thank you so much, Diego, for addressing the audience questions. I think we have no more questions and I will pass the mic.